So this webinar looks at the lessons learned over the past six months by the NEDPRO Nutrition and COVID-19 Task Force in conjunction with BMJ Nutrition, Prevention and Health. And we're very pleased today to bring this to you as a joint production between the International Academy of Nutrition Educators as part of the regular webinar series of the Academy in conjunction with NEDPRO and BMJ Nutrition. Uh, I'm Shimon Ray and uh, I will be uh, acting as host and moderator uh, for this webinar and you can see my roles and declarations of interest on this slide. A few points to mention that um, this has been a, a very um, intensive six months and we're going to try to give you a potted summary of what we've learnt um, around nutrition COVID-19. The slides will be uh, content heavy in relation to usual, however they will all be available as open access uh, for you to view later and for you to look in more detail at some of the nuances of content. Uh, we also have a linked online journal club which will explore some of the themes from this webinar uh, that we will in fact expand on further and that will promote further discussion on future direction. Um, we do intend for this webinar to be primarily for professionals within this domain or related fields. Um, and so with that disclaimer, uh, we hope that it will be useful to one and all. Um, however, some of the terminology and language is uh, really geared to a professional community. And finally, before uh, we go into our proceedings, um, I would like to particularly welcome uh, the panelists we have today, members of the NEDPRO Virtual Core, members of the International Academy, as well as guest attendees who are in the live session from the Swiss Re Institute, as well as the World Health Organization. So I'd request all of the panelists to make themselves visible as we go to the next slide. So just a, a quick um, overview of the purpose of our task force. So six months ago, when we set the task force up, uh, this was very much in order to provide a, an organizational response um, and direction to um, our members in over 14 countries in our central and regional networks in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. That led to a 10 point summary uh, that was put together rapidly uh, in the month of March uh, 2020 in relation to nutrition and COVID-19. This then led to the establishment of the task force and you can hear more about that from one of the panelists later on, um, but really bringing together research practice and public health. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we've been able to uh, put forward uh, living updates um, on our microsites over the past six months. Um, with a focus on uh, really research and evidence synthesis and a number of other communication and information sharing materials which we've developed. Next. So just to point out some of the key um, proponents of the task force, uh, we're joined by Dominic Crockholm, who has been co-chair, um, Shane McAuliffe, who will lead the next part of the presentation as science comms lead. Um, and I'd like to also call out to our digital lead and secretariat, without whose inputs we would not have been able to operate in this virtual format. Uh, other panelists drawn from the task force today uh, include uh, James Bradfield, Elaine McEninch, who will be uh, presenting shortly, um, Martin Kohlmeyer, uh, Marjorie Lima Davale, who provides a link to our International Knowledge Application Hub, um, and all of these individuals will be uh, on the panel afterwards 
uh, looking at some of the wider implications and discussions from the presentation. Next. Our approach has been very much one of evidence-informed nutrition as we've been operating in uh, what I would term, uh, to quote a colleague, as a VUCA space, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And decision making still needs to be done in terms of uh, COVID-19 management um, and that decision making needs to be informed by the best available research evidence, the actual population that we're dealing with, uh, the resources that we have available, and obviously the environmental as well as organizational context. So this has been a challenging process for one and all, um, as we've tried to put together an evidence base which is firstly very young and secondly still very dynamic. Next. However, um, our outputs have included, as I was saying, live updates in the form of a, a microsite, um, which provides overall public health uh, guidance, uh, particularly mapping to our regional networks um, in different parts of the world. Um, as we can't look at the issue of nutrition uh, separate to wider connections with public health, we then have a, a specific nutrition resources subsite, uh, which brings together guidelines, um, many of which are rapidly put together by uh, learned bodies, uh, region specific guidance, but also further guidance using the research that we've instigated or curated um, in partnership with BMJ Nutrition Prevention and Health. Next, please. So here's a little glimpse of our microsite um, and you can see that we have articles, blogs and publications. Next. Uh, looking further into the BMJ nutrition piece, we'll hear later on from the editor in chief. Um, but here's a, a collection of a number of different articles which can be grouped under nutrition and immunity in relation to COVID-19. Uh, extrapolating safely from what was known before, as well as um, making re reasonable uh, conclusions in relation to what can and cannot be done at present. Uh, vitamin D and COVID-19, which has been very topical, uh, where there's also been um, plenty of debate and certainly new research. Um, and of course, the issue of global food and nutrition security. Uh, all of these have come at a time when there have been major events in the world on the nutrition stage, um, namely the launch of the Global Nutrition Report, as well as the SOFI State of Food Insecurity Report um, by the uh, United Nations uh, uh, in conjunction with the FAO and WHO. Next. So just to take a, a quick dive into um, the piece that looks at micronutrients, you can see that uh, we have different um, types of articles um, that have drawn rapidly from the information available to us. Uh, one taking the form of a brief report, which has um, actually guided um, policy uh, particularly in the United Kingdom and certainly has sparked policy debate. Uh, one looking much more at the uh, physiological underpinnings of nutrition and immunity uh, and uh, also articles that look specifically at uh, whether or not a particular approach is needed in at-risk populations such as uh, the elderly. Um, we've then actually had the opportunity to take a detailed look at micronutrients um, in particular, uh, looking at a number of high risk groups beyond the elderly, uh, and then focusing on sometimes forgotten micronutrients uh, such as uh, zinc, but also looking at conceptual uh, matters such as the uh, avoidance of vitamin D deficiency uh, as a means of 
potentially modulating um, progression of the pandemic. Um, all of these are based on best available evidence and reasonable assumptions. But now I'm very pleased to hand over to Shane McAuliffe, who will take us through the detail of our findings in nutritional adequacy and COVID-19 for the next part of the presentation. Shane. Thanks, Ron. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, this evening. My name is Shane Cauliffe. I'm a registered dietitian working in the NHS, and I also function as the science and digital communications lead with NEDPRO. Um, I am really pleased to be presenting to you on some of our work and some of our learnings on the topic of nutritional adequacy and COVID-19. So good place to start to be a little bit of background on the relationship with of nutrition with infection. Um, the presence of infection increases metabolic demand for energy yielding substrates which facilitate the production of immune system cells and also immune system mediators. These can primarily be grouped as glucose, amino acids and fatty acids, but these processes also require vitamins and minerals as cofactors. For this reason, we see increased requirements for key nutrients during times of infection, which can mean that higher status is sometimes required to help support an adequate immune response. Optimal nutrition status then helps to fuel immune system responsiveness, whereas inadequate status can result in blunted response. And this is made very clear to us by conditions of nutritional deficiency. We've seen rapid changes in food environments and living conditions in recent times and global nutrition transition is generating a new double burden of malnutrition in which we are seeing undernutrition and overweight coexist. We see that both of these states have the potential to impair the adequate functioning of the immune system. Interestingly, despite the obvious differences in the presentation of under and overnutrition, we can identify common pathways between these two conditions, and many of which are detrimental to immune system responses. We see impaired in function of both the innate and the adaptive immune systems, meaning that those with poor nutrition status can be at increased risk of contracting infection and then less able to fight it off once infected. In the first instance, optimizing provision of calories and protein or macronutrient adequacy will help to prevent malnutrition. Much of our early knowledge on the effects of undernutrition have stemmed from outcomes in poorly nourished children, where we see impaired production and function of immune cells and also reductions in innate and adaptive immune function. In the developed world, we see high levels of malnutrition in the community, which is associated with poor clinical outcomes when these patients are admitted to secondary care. Admission to hospital with a poor nutritional reserve is predictive of poor clinical outcomes for a number of reasons listed here. On the other side of this, we have obesity which has gained a lot of recent attention due to its association with poor outcomes during the pandemic. These findings have been consistent with previous knowledge in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome who have obesity and tend to fare worse in critical illness. We can also draw on learnings from previous epidemics where the H1N1 infection we observed poor vaccine response and overall recovery. We see these metabolic issues overlap with conditions like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which have also been associated with high rates of infection complications and mortality. While we may observe the rate of infection to be similar in these groups, 
global data suggests that patients with diabetes, for example, have up to a threefold higher mortality rate compared with the rate seen in COVID-19 patients overall. Poor glycemic control appears to be a key defining factor in this instance, as has been demonstrated from large data sets in both the UK and in China. We have also seen studies of Chinese data recently published in the European Journal of Cardiology, which observed higher rates of mortality in patients with hypertension. Interestingly, these rates were higher again in those not being treated with medication. This is a topic that gathered much interest, particularly surrounding the use of antihypertensive medications like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers due to their potential to increase the availability of ACE2, which provides the site of entry of the COVID-19 virus to whole cells. However, the findings listed here have been followed by recommendations from the European Society of Cardiology not to discontinue related hypertensive medications based on the observed effect on outcomes. Beyond macronutrients, we see emerging evidence for an important role of micronutrients in maintaining and improving immune function through a number of mechanisms. These functions act at all levels of the immune response from the external physical to internal production of immune proteins, cells, and also the mediation of inflammatory processes. Infection-related consequences of deficient micronutrient status can be demonstrated through the classic example of chronic vitamin C deficiency, also known as scurvy. We also see links with respiratory disease traced back to our early understanding of control, with pneumonia being one of the most frequent complications and causes of death in scurvy. We see supplementation of vitamin C being effective in reducing pneumonia incidence and duration in hospitalized older adults, although recent trial evidence has demonstrated limited effects of higher dose supplementation on clinical endpoints in critically ill patients with ARDS. Since our earlier knowledge on vitamin D, it's been established that our immune system needs a variety of micronutrients for optimal function. These include vitamins A, C, D, E, B vitamins, zinc, iron, and selenium, which play vital and often synergistic roles at every stage of the immune response. This means that existing micronutrient deficiencies, even if only a single micronutrient, can impair immune function and increase susceptibility to infectious disease. On the other side of it, correction of established deficiencies or in some cases, suboptimal status, may have the potential to mitigate risk of infection through supporting immune function. We see that the effects of an immune response to COVID-19 share common characteristics with more well-characterized respiratory tract infections. Correction of particular micronutrient deficiencies has proven effective in some of these diseases and has shown to promote favorable clinical outcomes. Individual micronutrients also appear to play a key role in mediating the inflammatory response and these effects can be enhanced through correction of deficiencies, particularly in the case of vitamin D, zinc and selenium. National and international data reminds us that micronutrient deficiencies are far from being a thing of the past, even in developed nations like the UK and also much more widely. For example, the UK NDNS demonstrates widespread inadequacies in status of vitamin D, vitamin A, folate, and selenium across the UK population. In particular, we've seen focus directed towards groups who are at higher risk during the pandemic. And these people also tend to be at higher risk of micronutrient deficiencies and poor nutrition overall. In many of these groups, diet alone may not be sufficient to meet elevated requirements and that means that micronutrient deficiencies pose a considerable risk to health. In such cases, 
the immune system can be supported by supplementation, particularly to help correct deficiencies, and in some cases to match the effects of concurrent treatments. If we consider vitamin D as an example, in light of considerable interest in the potential role of vitamin D in COVID-19, we have seen BMJ Nutrition Prevention and Health publish a selection of recent peer-reviewed articles on this topic. At this moment, there is not sufficient peer-reviewed and published evidence to support high-dose vitamin D supplementation for the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. Because of concerns with the potential harm from excessive vitamin D supplements, the use of high-dose supplements isn't advised routinely. However, this does not mean that high-dose supplements have no role in the prevention or treatment of COVID-19. It's just their effectiveness has not yet been tested. We do know that avoiding vitamin D deficiency is important for health. And for this reason, any measure taken to prevent deficiency should be report, supported at all times. This can be possible through obtaining sufficient vitamin D from food and, and moderately dosed vitamin D supplements where required, particularly in those who are at high risk of deficiency. At times, in severe cases of defi severe deficiency, it may require treatment with higher doses, but ensuring that this is under appropriate clinical supervision. We've seen many of these messages echoed in a recent publication on vitamin D from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK, in which our Nutrition and COVID-19 Task Force had an input during the review process. Again, as mentioned, we see groups at higher risk during the pandemic also tending to be those at risk of poor overall nutrition. Elderly individuals fall into this category who experience a deterioration in immune function with the aging process alongside impaired nutrient absorption and often reduced dietary intakes. For example, we see reduced capacity for antioxidant production and also reduced vitamin D synthesis in the skin. For this reason, elderly individuals are more likely to contract con infections many of which last longer and which put them at increased risk of complications and poor outcomes. The role of micronutrients in mediating the inflammatory response is becoming particularly relevant when we consider the systemic inflammatory response observed in sepsis, sepsis rather, which is an overreactive host response to infection. This pro-inflammatory state is referred to as a cytokine storm which occurs through the response of the innate immune system and damages host tissue. This can contribute to severe lung injury and respiratory failure, which is becoming a common complication and cause of death during the pandemic. Key micronutrients of interest in this case are vitamin D, selenium and zinc, all of which have demonstrated poor outcomes in cases of deficient status and all of which have potential to mitigate inflammatory processes when status is corrected. So where does this knowledge leave us and what do we do next? In terms of policy, we've seen nutrition come under the spotlight on many fronts during this pandemic. On the level of macronutrients, there has been much focus on obesity and poor metabolic health due to its relationship with poor outcomes. At the other extreme, we're starting to understand the toll that an infection like COVID-19 takes in the body, particularly in those who fall critically ill through impacts on both lean and functional mass for those who survive. Nutrition will be a key part of the puzzle in their recovery. On the level of micronutrients, we've seen a recognition of their role in the health of the immune system, as well as highlighting wide deficiencies at a population level which has posed questions as to the wider relationship of these factors with our health. There now seems to be acknowledgement of the prevalence of low vitamin D status and also recognition that supplementation will be required to correct it in many cases. This has made us consider those in our society at higher risk of deficiency, including those required to cocoon and stay indoors, people at higher latitudes and also members of 
the Bain community, which has left us to develop population specific guidelines and recommendations. We can ask in which other markers of nutritional status could this approach be employed? In terms of our clinical practice, it's clear that conditions of nutrient deficiency impair immune function and increase susceptibility to infection. Importantly, both of these outcomes can be prevented by treating the deficiency. We can look to existing knowledge and trial evidence from related infections and clinical conditions to help guide us further. Could there be a role for vitamin D, selenium and zinc in the mediation of inflammatory response and sepsis, for example? Is there limited benefit of vitamin C therapy in the treatment of sepsis and ARDS? Ultimately, we must ask ourselves as practitioners if micronutrient status is being overlooked in clinical practice. And if so, how can we find efficient and effective ways of screening for it? Before the level of diagnosed deficiency, there will be many of those who have suboptimal intakes and status of one or more essential nutrients. While it's not yet clear how these affects the immune system in these groups, it's possible that those with poorer status or suboptimal status may have suboptimal immune responses, which could contribute to some immune variation in the general population. Lastly, in terms of future research, as of now, given the speed at which the pandemic has developed, there are few published studies on the precise role of nutrition in the prevention or the treatment of COVID-19. In order to define this, to provide evidence-informed guidelines, we'll need carefully designed studies, first considering available data from population and patient sources. sources. This can be followed by ethically approved and applicable intervention studies where the data suggests that these are appropriate. In the absence of this evidence so far, the best option we have had has been to synthesize already published evidence and then make reasonable assumptions based on our previous knowledge of the relationship between nutrition, immunity and infections. So thank you all for your attention. With that, I will hand over to Elaine McIninch, who will be looking at how the pandemic has influenced our, well, the topic of health inequalities and also food and nutrition security. Thank you for this opportunity to present some of our work looking at the implications of COVID-19 on widening health inequalities and the emergence of nutrition insecurity. So I've been working alongside Dr. Kathy Martin and Dr. Marjorie Lima DeVille to understand better the uh, organisations on the ground experience. Our full paper will be published in the BMJ Nutrition, Prevention and Health. And today I just want to highlight some of our initial findings. And so, so, so the aim was, was really we wanted to capture the real time experiences of organisations involved in the emergency food response one month into COVID-19 containment measures in relation to the support measures that were available and early data. So we'll talk through some of the background, some definitions and some early insights uh, focusing on the main themes that came up from our, our paper, which is increasing demands, meeting the needs of specific groups, awareness of the food supply and concerns over sustainability. We'll finish by looking at the opportunities and lessons, le lessons learned. So some brief definitions here from the FAO is a food insecurity experience scale, which is used commonly and classified using the eight questions below and classifying people into either severely insecure as experiencing hunger or worrying about the ability to obtain food and mildly food insecure. The issue is, is that, that it's, this is this is there's no current surveillance over the population or screening, at least in the UK. So it could be very hard to identify people that are in the, any of these categories. In the US, however, guidance from the American Academy of Family Physicians have come up with this evidence-based food screening 
tool. Very simple, but two questions. We'd be worried that there are food may run out before we had money to buy more or the food that we bought just didn't last and we didn't have enough money to get any more. And pointing out that it's not just underweight patients that, that may appear like they're not eating very well, but also this is likely to occur in normal and overweight patients and those who appear quite well put together. So systematic screening is argued the only way to identify everyone at risk. So perhaps this is a good start. As we all know, this is so much more than tackling hunger. Food and nutrition security is important so that we can provide food that's appropriately nutritious to sustain health. And that is coupled with the appropriate sanitary environment and adequate health services and care in order to enable these processes and to uh, pick up vulnerable people that may need more support, help and guidance. As is in many countries here in the UK, health inequalities are widening. And this is based on a report that was, was released earlier this year, 10 years after the initial report, raising the alarm on uh, health inequalities and the disparity between those that have more money and those that have less money. This new report shows that there's a stalling of life expectancy for the first time. And the poorest in society have seven years less life than those with more money and 12 of those years living with ill health compared to those with higher incomes. The FAO estimate that we have 2.2 million people in the severely food insecure bracket, which is the highest in Europe, and almost 20% of children living in a food insecure household, with a half of those classified as severely food insecure. On top of this, problems with accessibility of food, with 12% of over 65s already having trouble accessing a shop for groceries, and the alarm being raised by Age UK about what that means for this group of people during the pandemic. So a little more on, the, on our methods and the organisations that we included. In rapidly changing situations such as COVID-19, informal conversations can add context and authenticity to enrich published data. So we have lots of recommendations for policy coming out, uh, but how is that going to be translated on the ground? And that's what we wanted to find out. So these were organisations that we were already professionally um, uh, connected with, and we developed a questionnaire if we, to, in order to gather uh, um, it, further insights. So the groups that we included was a community volunteer group who didn't have anything to do with food actually, but reorganised their services, which was all, all groups of volunteers that were working in environmental services. And they were going door to door around all of the houses local in their village, picking out uh, people who were struggling to access food and particularly helping out elderly residents. Elderly Services Charity and a non-profit food partnership who were providing advice and uh, also providing emergency food and access to food banks and access to food delivery services prior to the pandemic who were able to increase their services. A food bank who obviously were providing emergency food prior to the pandemic who saw a massive increase in demand. And our only NHS service, which was a newly formed oncology food bank, basically what they did is they were using food that was designated to be used in a, a cafe, which had to be closed, and also food that was being donated by the public, designed to be used by staff. But the dietitian who was working in that service managed to repurpose that food that wasn't required by the staff, but was really required by the patients attending for treatment for their cancer therapy. So here's our questions. We asked uh, what the impact of COVID-19 was on the team. What were the concerns and food provision, positive learning and uh, any future implications? And these were compared to government support measures and early published data. And here's some of our findings. 
So there were some things that were making it easier for these organisations to meet demand, one being the goodwill and positive community action. There was lots of volunteers. There was increased financial support available from the government to assist food charities, but this was much easier to access for well-established groups. And there was massive logistical challenges. So not only were they dealing with unprecedented demands for their services, but they had to move premises, move to delivery only services. For example, the food bank that we were working with used to be working in the middle of a town centre, but had to be moved to work in the outskirts due to, to police warnings that there may be an increased risk of gatherings around the centre or even looting. There were barriers for people accessing help. Uh, so, so most of our services required somebody to uh, phone up and ask for help or be referred on for help. But some services, for example, elderly care services and the oncology food bank went to patients and asked them, how are you getting on at home? And, and reported that it was quite difficult to find out, uh, to determine which which of those patients were, were, were struggling because of perhaps a stigma or a shame in asking for help. And finally, accessing suitable foods. So, so the example uh, given being head and neck cancer patients who require high calorie protein, uh, a modified consistency that was difficult for relatives and uh, in, neighbours to, to cater for that. There were government supplied food parcels. One, there was access, difficulty in, in people accessing those food parcels, but those food parcels were not suitable for, for people with specific needs. Consistently across all of our cases was problems with IT access. One with the ability to use IT and having accessibility to that and connectivity, particularly in our rural areas. The increased demand reported by the organisations we were working with was reflected nationally. So there was an 89% increase in need for food bank use, according to the Trussell Trust, which manages about 60% of food banks in the UK, and a 175% increase in need for the in independent food aid, who manages the, the additional 40% of food banks in the UK. And of those people accessing food banks, they were more likely to have mental health issues, in fact half, um, more likely to have long-term health problems, and it was and increased numbers of young families accessing services. Further, this increased demand has been highlighted internationally across the world. It's been estimated that it, there will be an additional 83 to 132 million people added to the ranks of undernourishment following 2020, dependent on economic predictions. And also the lower price, longer shelf life um, food that's required, coupled with limited access to fresh and nutritious food, suggests that highly processed products are going to be consumed in higher quantities, leading to lower diet quality. And this is going to impact on micronutrient deficiencies and also increasing the risk of non-communicable diseases, including the risk, increased risk potentially of uh, obesity. Similar to our findings, this surveillance of uh, UK food insecurity of 4,500 participants found that those identifying themselves as being food insecure, only 68%, 68% of those had not asked for any help or received any help because they didn't want to ask for help, they feel bad asking for help, or they didn't know where to get help from. Previously mentioned, there are specific groups that are more vulnerable to food insecurity, where their needs were really not being met by the uh, measures that were put into place. This is Barry Donald, and she's running the Oncology Food Bank, uh, and simply says, we have lots of patients who are very vulnerable. They can't leave the house to go shopping because they're shielding. So how do they get their food? You can see behind her lots of tins of soup, custard, rice pudding, the type of foods that are suitable for her patients, but obviously uh, in a quite a unique situation that might not be suitable for all. The digital divide, um, rural versus urban areas. 
Secondly, there were concerns over food systems and sustainability of current uh, efforts. So these scenes will be familiar to many of you, I'm sure, where panic buying resulted in empty supermarket shelves. And making up the shortfall was often local suppliers. And indeed, there was over a, a doubling of fruit and veg box sales here in the UK. Uh, there's a real concern about disrupted food and supply chains uh, moving across borders that, that may be shut, loss of employment, and we have Brexit coming at the end of the year here in the UK, just to add that little bit of extra pressure to our uh, trade agreements. There's concerns over the long-term resilience of food banks and how we supply food banks with food where um, the population may be struggling to meet demands anyway. So finally, we'll leave you with a few recommendations. It's important that we think about preventative measures to avoid the institutionalisation of emergency food solutions. And really taking advantage to tailor the programmes that, that have uh, responded to COVID-19, to think about individualised community needs, working with people, driving initiatives with people within those communities. Nutritionists and dietitians can ensure appropriate foods to need, but we also need nutrition education for health professionals to recognise food insecurity and recognise those that need additional help and support through assessment and signposting. We need to consider accessibility of food help and we need to reduce the stigma and shame in asking for help and getting people to the right place for the right help when it's needed. But crucially, we need more data driven surveillance to better define the issues in those at risk groups. Academic public health and clinician collaboration on research and publication, what works and what doesn't work. And remember, we're talking about mainly volunteers who are taking up a lot of the uh, um, hard work here. Taking advantage of this public interest and learn from empowered community groups and the positive here is, is that change is possible. Nutrition security is much more than hunger prevention. We need to appropriate, uh, uh, champion appropriate interventions and uh, ensure that, that the foods are appropriate to populations. Further to our recommendations, the State of Food and Security and Nutrition in the World 2020 policy actions are highlighted here. So also they talk about expanding and improving emergency assistance and social protection programmes, uh, coordinating uh, to, to avoid widespread famine, trade and tax policies to keep global trade open, focusing on logistics and health and similar to us, looking at smallholders to enhance productivity and scaling up double duty action. So as we talked about, this is not just people who are losing weight. We're talking about nutritious diets in order to, uh, to prevent further exacerbation of health inequalities in the future. Considering the initiation of food fortification programmes and putting in economic stimulus for proper recovery for strengthened food access, managing always at safety risks and food contamination. So finally, it's important to champion and support your local food heroes and to think about how we can promote their services and, and strengthen the work that's happened already. So I want to leave you with the Global Nutrition uh, Report 2020. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, there's now increasing emphasis on the central role of nutrition and health and well-being. And COVID-19 has highlighted the need for more sustainable and equitable food and health systems. After this crisis, nutrition must be understood and recognised as indispensable part of food and education economic development. And it's up to us as policymakers and clinicians to uh, coordinate this massive effort and to take advantage of the goodwill for of the public and in order to move forward in what looks like is going to be an economic recession. So finally I want to leave you with the questions that we ask um, our participants. How has COVID-19 impacted your team or country? What are the main concerns? What are the positives that could be learned from this and what do you think the future implications are? 
And I wonder uh, within your own areas if there's any similarities in the cases that we've discussed and what's happening on the ground here in the UK. And hopefully we can share uh, stories and uh, uh, better uh, understand some of the gaps and, and, and where we can build on successes. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to taking your questions later. Thank you very much uh, Shane and Elaine for two uh, very comprehensive presentations. Uh, in the time that we have uh, remaining uh, I'd like to invite all of the panellists to now make themselves visible uh, along with the speakers. Um, so panel one, uh, I'm going to ask to respond particularly in their task force capacities, but also in relation to the first presentation by Shane and then panel two um, to respond to the second presentation by Elaine. Um, Dom, as I've mentioned, uh, is a medical doctor and co-chairs the task force. Um, Martin is both a medical doctor and professor of nutrition, editor-in-chief of uh, BMJ Nutrition. Uh, James takes uh, lead on educational matters uh, for the task force, um, being a registered dietitian. Marjorie, a, um, a nutrition scientist, um, from a dietetic background uh, provides a, a particular link to uh, knowledge resources and uh, I'd call upon each one in sequence to provide uh, a few comments um, and time permitting the speakers might respond uh, at the end. So uh, Dominic please. Uh, thanks Shimon. Uh, as, as you've said I'm, I'm a medical doctor but also been in uh, co-chairing this task force for the last nearly six months and it's been a really productive really interesting time uh, for all of us. Um, I'll start by commenting on, on Shane's piece which I think is an excellent article um, and, and I recommend it to everyone uh, Shane's piece on micronutrient deficiencies. It, the, the thing that always strikes me and I see this in my clinical practice and, and, and Shane mentioned this is that micronutrient deficiencies are not a thing of the past and they're certainly not a thing of just the developing world and it's not uncommon for us to see these um, present in clinical practice. Um, it's something that I think we as a medical body could do more to identify, so look to do the testing for, um, and also recognize and, and, and treat people who have um, micronutrient deficiencies. We often see them in, in patients who have, uh, coinc it often coincides with other forms of malnutrition. So uh, those who are obese or underweight often have micronutrient deficiencies. And I would be interested to hear from um, Martin, uh, Professor Kohlmeyer, on which you know, micronutrients have caught his attention in relation to the research landscape during COVID-19. Um, so th thank you, Shane, and thank you, Elaine, <clears throat> as well for her, her talk on food insecurity. Um, it's really uh, highlighted the importance of health inequalities in food and nutrition security and the impact that that has on health. Um, I think the big thing that stands out regarding food in a, uh, food security for me is, is the, the need for data. And we need, we need to be able to define food insecurity um, for both academic and real life point of views. Um, so we as a task force are very keen um, on, on, on looking at this task and this is something we continue to work on, identifying where we can find the data and how, how to ask the questions um, that would give us the information that we need to help define the problem and, and work on the solutions to food insecurity. Um, and this is something we continue to work on with our collaborators. Um, I was asked to comment on some of the challenges that we've had as a task force and chairing the task force. And I wanted to just, just take a few minutes to um, highlight a few of those uh, challenges. We've seen that COVID-19 has presented lots of different problems uh, from a nutrition standpoint, um, from clinical, from the from, from COVID as a clinical entity, um, in terms of best medical practice, um, but we also it also very quickly became clear that the pandemic itself, in terms of government responses, was going to have a huge impact on public health in terms of in terms of food security, as Elaine has touched upon, and the disruption to normal life. Um, as the public uh, as the pandemic unfolded, 
it became clear that primary prevention, metabolic health and dietary risk factors um, were, were important and they certainly become a hot topic of debate. So for us, uh, one of the main challenges was deciding who to, who to ask to be on as part of a task force. Um, and, and we have been very lucky to be able to pull together experts from clinical medicine, clinical nutrition, dietetics, um, public health scientists and academics, um, as well as experts in, in academic publishing and research. So that's been, that's been, that's been great to have that breadth of, of expertise on this, on this task force. Some of the other key challenges have been the fast pace of change during the pandemic, and I'm sure that's something that everyone can relate to handling the unknown and the fear and anxieties that have come from the pandemic, especially in the early weeks and months where there was still a lot of debate on how to handle this disease, how to respond and, and, and also a recognition that because NEDPRO is a global organization, there were different arms of, the, uh, of, of our uh, uh, broader uh, networks who were going through different periods of the pandemic or different phases of the pandemic uh, simultaneously. So it was a challenge for us to tailor the needs of our uh, networks um, and to sort of address their needs simultaneously when they were quite different at different times or at the same time. Um, I will end by just saying some of the positives and I think one of the great positives of this task force has been the collaborative work that we've done. Um, all of this work has been alongside professional uh, commitments. Um, it's been fantastic to have such a close dialogue with uh, the the journal, the BMJ Nutrition Prevention and Health Journal, and Martin, having Martin on the group has allowed us to have a close dialogue and focus our research priorities and um, discuss in a sort of a, a very constructive way where we should be focusing our attention in terms of um, best, best helping the, uh, the literature and the scientific landscape. Um, so just to summary and just uh, that's that's all I'd like to say really and just to summarize and say thank you to uh, Shane and Elaine for, for your talks and uh, Shimon for hosting this and uh, I look forward to answering any questions or any further responses uh, if you'd like me to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will have uh, just to remind everyone more discussion and Q&A in the related online journal club um, but uh, I'm just going to ask each of the other panelists to respond for just a couple of minutes. Uh, Martin. Sure. Um, I think I should start with that this um, uh, confluence of uh, pretty momentous uh, developments. I mean, not only do we have a generational disruption of life, of health, of everything, uh, I think every single one of us is affected. But as a minor little uh, blip uh, in history, we have just uh, celebrated the second anniversary uh, of the journal, BMJ Nutrition Prevention and Health. So uh, this has been just as important in some uh, aspects and uh, the COVID epidemic has kind of uh, provided us an opportunity to prove ourselves in uh, that we suddenly had an unexpected, not planned for challenge. Uh, what we were focusing on very rapidly is looking at uh, the nutritional consequences of an infectious disease uh, situation. So we established quickly uh, within a few weeks uh, a special collection which has grown to now eight uh, fully peer reviewed uh, submissions. Uh, a ninth one uh, will be, has been peer reviewed and will be posted in a week or so. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and as we have gone through this, uh, we actually have grown ourselves, both in terms of uh, the, the um, institutional uh, strength, uh, building groups like uh, one group, uh, particularly looking at vitamin D, 
but also, uh, as Dominic has been uh, laying out very nicely, to have a very effective rapid response group. Uh, this was not a simple thing, pulling together uh, high-level contributors. Uh, the easier part uh, was, you know, our own contributions. But uh, we had a number of other high-level contributors. And I would urge uh, all those on the call to, to really take a look at what the journal offers. Uh, we have not just uh, focused on COVID. There are a number of very broad range of other issues, uh, all the way going to green architecture, how that may impact health. And if I may come around uh, to uh, vitamin D, uh, which has kind of become a focal point because it's so tangible. I think it's really very interesting to see that the name was really quite well chosen. Uh, I have to admit I was a little bit uh, less uh, enthusiastic about such a lengthy name, not just saying BMJ Nutrition, but actually Prevention and Health. Uh, vitamin D is actually mostly related not so much to dietary intake, but to lifestyle, to uh, UVB uh, exposition. So older people who are locked up, uh, uh, people living uh, at higher latitude, but also people living in areas with uh, air pollution or uh, weather that is frequently overcast uh, makes it difficult to get enough vitamin D because they are not very good food sources. Even in the U.S. where uh, there is a fortification of milk uh, and very few other products uh, does not really, you know, provide sufficient uh, intake. So, uh, this is really um, what we have been looking at uh, when the journal pulling together all these various aspects um, in terms of uh, not just uh, nutritional contrib uh, contributing factors, but also the consequences uh, of the uh, epidemic itself on food insecurity, etc. And uh, I want to point to the final, uh, con or the most recent contribution uh, that is going to be, as I said, be posted in about a week or so, that investigated uh, the behavior uh, of uh, physicians and other health providers for the elderly. Uh, giving access to vitamin D supplements to older people, such as in nursing homes, and discussing in depth how there are barriers that we haven't really uh, expected because vitamin D is broadly perceived uh, as uh, a prescription requiring uh, supplement. So uh, it really, uh, the, the uh, journal really addresses practice issues. It pra uh, addresses uh, molecular issues uh, very broadly. So there's always something when I read it, and I have the uh, privilege you. to always read it first, I learn something. So I hope you will too. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, so we are coming up to time. Uh, given the importance of the topic at hand, I'm going to ask the other panelists to very briefly make a few key points, uh, remembering that this is part of two twinned presentations. So there will be scope for those panelists to say more um, in the online journal club that explores some of the themes further. Uh, James and Marjorie, and then I will let uh, Elaine have the last word um, as we close. 
Yeah, so very briefly, thank you to everyone who's presented and, and everyone's comments so far. I think it's been a very interesting couple of months and uh, working with the task force. And I think we've uh, shown some of the lessons that we've learned along the way and obviously highlighted some of the challenges that we've faced both as a task force, but as a, I suppose, as a society and as a, as a you know, um, you could say as a species um, over the last number of months. But just very briefly to comment more on the um, the food security side of things and to, I suppose, I won't go into the details too much now, but to direct people to um, a couple of resources that we have brought out that, that touch on food security over the last few months. So the Ned Pro podcast, uh, which is something that we've been running for the last um, almost 12 months at this stage, we did uh, an episode with Malden um, Council. Malden is a, an area um, in Essex here in the UK, and it was talking with members of their um, council and, and the public health response, including things like food banks and food parcels and also some of their local uh, partners. And then I also had a conversation with um, Dr. Ronita Bardon, who's a, an architect um, who's actually was, uh, spoke to me about how the response to COVID has differed between the UK and in Kolkata in India. And we had a big long conversation about how the physical environment and where people live and where people exist is also a very large contribute uh, very has a very large contribution to health and well-being and the ability to cook and the access to food as well so i won't go into what we found but um it's your uh they're there for you on all podcast um, streaming services so if you are interested in in how nutrition uh, security and food security therefore has changed over the course of covid they might be two good places to go so marjorie if you have any comments Thanks, James. Um, I'm just going to make a very brief comment regarding the presentations that were made by Shane and Elaine today, because for me, basically what is stood out from all the presentation is the need that we have for more data to inform action, both at policy and practice, and how knowing the background of the different countries, different communities regarding food and nutrition security and other aspects related to nutrition would be helpful to guide the first response to the COVID when we didn't have the time to collect more data to inform action. So having that kind of background information is something that would be really helpful. And also in continuing to gather more data to inform future action as the COVID is progressing from the acute phases to a more extended phases and second wave of the COVID. And I think that is also important that it was also highlighted how different groups, they have different needs. So Dom was, talking about the need to screen for food and nutrition security, but also equally important is also to assess the factors driving food and nutrition security for different groups. So we'll be able to develop more responsive and tailored action to meet the needs of different groups, as Elaine was highlighting for the elderly that didn't have access to internet or more other technological resources, or for the, case, uh, the cancer patients who didn't and uh, the food that was offered in the traditional food baskets were not adequate for the food intake. So I think that as nutritionists and dietitians and all the other healthcare professionals and other education and um, welfare sectors as well to be able to respond to the needs of everyone and make sure that um, vulnerable groups are not left unheard or um, untreated. Uh, but there are also some positive sides related to it. There are uh, global efforts being conducted also by the FAO in trying to organize, to collect data on the food availability, access and behaviors from different countries, and also uh, creative and innovative ideas on trying to collect data and the different responses that were made to try to address the issues related to food and nutrition uh, and security. And as a part of the NetPro, we are also engaged in a global effort to try to collect data across our 10 regional networks. So the results are going to be available soon. And the idea is to try to identify which, which types of food and nutrition information and data is being collected to identify gaps and hopefully to be able to provide recommendations for practice to address the needs of everyone that were affected by the COVID. Thank you very much, Marjorie, and please stay tuned for the online 
journal club that we'll explore and discuss further. And as we close, I'm just going to let Elaine have the last word. Thanks everyone. Thanks to uh, I aim for hosting and to all the panel and presenters. I I think um, we're we're working very rapidly to to produce our um, policy and recommendations, but I I think it's how that's translated uh, is really important on the ground. So. Uh, yeah, I, and I look forward, as Martin, to, to reading the new article because I think that highlights exactly that, that we have vitamin D, there are many barriers out there. Um, um, and the people who are working on the ground at the moment are often volunteers. They're not paid professionals. They're not, they're not um, research professionals. They're not nutrition professionals often. Uh, so, you know, and, and how can we work on the ground and and to help to enhance what's happening already and yeah thank you everybody thank you so with Cheers. that call to action a huge thank you once again uh particularly to shane for uh, masterminding the scientific uh structure of this piece um uh to uh all of the speakers and panelists today to Mateus for uh, the digital operations underpinning everything that the task force has done to all of the task force and to everyone for uh, giving up time today to attend and hope to connect with you in the next presentation and uh, keep this very important work going with the call to action as Elaine very nicely summarized. Thank you very much all. Stay safe and stay All connected. Right.